Hello and welcome to the Hipper Survival Guide Director's Cut. This is a new series that we're rolling out. It will be several episodes where we cover specific topics of your HIPAA compliance. And this is really a spin-off from a series we used to do called Ask Me Anything Fridays. And um, with each episode, uh, I will be uh, interviewing Mr. Carlos Leila. He is the um, he is the CEO of Three Lions Publishing, the publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide, and the managing partner at the Digital Business Law Group. I am John Nelson. I'm an associate at the Digital Business Law Group and technology evangelist here at uh, the HIPAA Survival Guide. We are also joined by Martin Gwynn, our director of operations. So today we are going to uh, cover your HIPAA compliance story. And um, with each episode, uh, well, I'm doing the, uh, I'll be conducting the interviews. Uh, we, we can't always cover everything. So if you have any uh, questions for us on any topic that we cover, feel free to reach out to us at uh, support at threelinespublishing.com or on our uh, LinkedIn group. We have various means of uh, getting in touch with us. If you followed us at all, then you know how to uh, do that. So today, your HIPAA compliance story. And uh, Carlos, what, is, what does that even mean? What, uh, what does that entail? So we, we talk a lot about, uh, if you've been following our webinars and, and um, um, over in our newsletters, actually over the last five years, we talk about you know uh, crafting and telling a compliance story, and not, not a story that's in some fabrication that you're going to make up, but as a story, a story in the sense that of a narrative. How are you going to present your compliance program, your initiative to an auditor or to a court of law? Okay, how are you going to explain what it is that you're doing to comply with HIPAA? And we like to use this little graphic called the HIPAA Compliance Continuum. It's got three rectangles. And the leftmost rectangle, it says no story, no compliance story. And what that means is essentially you stuck your head in the sand. You haven't done a thing since the High Tech App Act came out in 2009. And all you have is that HIPAA three-ring binder that you've had, you know, since HIPAA came out in 2005 and you're going to present that to an auditor and you're going to be hit with a willful neglect fine of starting at $50,000 per violation and going up from there. Okay, essentially, that's a losing strategy. Right? The second rectangle in the continuum is a good compliance story. Now, a good compliance story is a story that gets better and better and better over time. Better at what? And we'll talk, I, I believe, more about this later. Better at producing visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance, okay? And the understanding in that middle rectangle is that, that is entitled good compliance story is it, it doesn't have to be a perfect compliance story. There's no such thing as perfect uh, compliance, okay? It just means that you have a strategy, you understand the changes in the law, you put together a plan, and you've gotten started, and hopefully started in a significant, non-trivial way on improving your HIPAA compliance initiative, or in, in our uh, terminology, your HIPAA compliance story. And the third rectangle on the continuum is full compliance. And full compliance is really this aspirational goal. Because the law changes, because of the, the landscape, um, you know, the threat landscape changes on a daily basis, full compliance is this aspirational goal that you may never get to. So the focus is on that middle rectangle, being able to continuously over time build a better compliance story or a better compliance narrative. This is essentially what you would sit down and tell an auditor or a perhaps uh, on the witness stand tell a, a jury um, in a lawsuit. Okay. Now, um, so obviously the, the three written binder approach is dead. Yeah, you, you need to do much more than that and constantly work on it over time. But you mentioned uh, visible demonstrable evidence, and that, that's, uh, that's something that we uh, talk about quite frequently here at the HIPAA Survival Guide, and uh, we abbreviate it VDE. So uh, what is uh, visible demonstrable evidence? If, if the three-ring three binder isn't good enough, then what else do you need? Okay. Um, so that's a great question, right, actually, because the three-ring binder represented in the old days when HIPAA was a paper tiger, toothless paper tiger, because it was never enforced. And the biggest fine you could have, I think it was like 
$100 per violation up to $25,000. Okay, and the dirty little secret that everybody knew in the industry was it was unenforced. And so nobody did anything about compliance with HIPAA until the High Tech Act came out. And the High Tech Act was a game changer for lots and lots of reasons, or primarily because of breach notification. But in the old days, right, that three ring binder was just these sets of templates, policies that you had that said, okay, I mean, that's all we need. We need these policies for the privacy rule. We need these policies for the security rule. And as long as we got those and we can show uh, an auditor that we have them, we should be good. Of course, no, no one ever audited. And so, right, that three ring binder gathered dust. And yes, you went through the formality of probably doing that feel good training for your staff once a year, et cetera. But that, that is no longer sufficient. So John's question is, is directly on point. Well, if that's not sufficient, then what is? Well, visible demonstrable evidence is obviously evidence of compliance, but it's evidence of compliance at the granularity level of a, a requirement. The three rules that you have to comply with, uh, to comply with HIPAA, are the HIPAA privacy rule, the HIPAA security rule, and the HIPAA breach notification rule. Those rules are each made up of requirements. Turns out that if you uh, have been paying attention to HHS audit protocol, at least round one, and they really haven't changed very much between round one and round two, except uh, at the margins, and they can't really change the requirements because the requirements are the requirements. What you have to comply with is those 169 requirements. Okay, And in order to comply with uh, the requirement, you have to show visible demonstrable evidence of compliance with the requirement. And so we, we have compliance equation that we use, and we say, there are three things that you have to have to comply with the requirement. You have to have a policy. What's your policy vis-a-vis -vis this requirement? Okay. Then you have to have a set of processes, organizational processes, that underpin the policy. Because otherwise, the policy is just a set of flowery language. It doesn't mean anything. Right? It's your intent. It's what you would like to do, what you say you're going to do. But if you can't show me the processes that you implemented, then you really haven't done anything. And number three is the ability to track process results. Okay, That's really, as an auditor or as a, as a court of law, in a court of law, uh, if I'm a judge or I'm sitting on the jury, that's what I want to see. What is your the results of your processes? So take, for example, training. You have a training policy. Okay, that's good. You have a training process. Okay, if I'm an auditor, I'm going to say, well, explain to me. Well, what's your training process like? Is it classroom-based? Is it video-based? Is it a test? If it's a test, how many questions? What's the passing score? Okay, and right, and then you're telling me about your process. And then I say, okay, show me the database where it says when was the last time you trained, you know, uh, Doc Joe or Doc uh, Jane or the receptionist or the nurse. Show me the results of the training. And if you can't show the results, then you don't have visible demonstrable evidence. You have to be able to show all three policies plus processes plus the ability to track process results equals VDE. Okay, so that's that's actually a lot that you have to do, and you have to do it uh, for each requirement. And there are 169 requirements. I mean, that's uh, that's a, a big forest to wade through. So, how do you develop a methodology for actually carrying that out, rather than just throwing a dart at the wall and saying, "Okay, today we're going to work on this requirement." Well, yes, it's pretty daunting, and, 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 and one of the things, at least for us, is uh, the understanding that we've been trying to convey is this understanding of, look, you don't have to guess. It doesn't have to be a mystery of how you comply with HIPAA. There used to be this, before the High Tech Act, the 42 questions that you might be asked in the HIPAA audit, and all this sort of nonsense as to these myths. It's the, the HHS can only ask you about the requirements that are in the law. So instead of doing this dance and trying to guess, what we've done is we've taken every requirement and parsed it out. And that's what our checklists do. Okay, Our privacy rule checklist covers every single one of the privacy rule requirements. Our security rule checklist, every single one of the security rule uh, requirements. And our breach notification rule, which is a, a kind of a, a, a worse of a different color, it's a kind of a preparedness uh, set of requirements. Are you ready? You have model letters. You know who to contact, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Our breach notification framework uh, covers that aspect. And what we say is, you have to adopt an agile methodology. Get started complying with some of this, and then build the plan for complying with the rest. Okay, so that you can make a good faith argument that you haven't buried your head in the sand. And 
We have these scorecards uh, that we've developed that track every single one of these requirements. You can say, yes, we have the requirement in place. No, we don't have it in place, but it's planned. No, we're not working on this at all, and, and so forth. And that's how you keep score of where, of where you're at. So you, you can actually tell your story based on this methodology that, in our case, we've developed around requirements. If you're doing anything else but tracking requirements, then you're approaching compliance in entirely the wrong way. So, with if it's all um, if it's all requirement based, uh, it, we do see a lot uh, of of myths surrounding HIPAA. Of, well, it, does it require this? Does it not require that? Uh, what is uh, what's an addressable uh, um, issue? What's required? What? Why do you think that there is such a uh, myth factory, uh, for lack of a better phrase, around this? Is it just that it's so daunting, or is it uh, lack of uh, motivation? What, what do you think is behind that? Yeah, that's that's probably a, a um, you know, we, we, we have to get into a little bit of sort of the, the psychology of the industry a little bit and this transition that the healthcare industry is going through. Obviously, we went from a place where, uh, there was no HIPAA enforcement to a place where the government was saying, no, there really is now, we're coming, we're coming, we're coming, and everybody said, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, okay, nothing was happening, and so people were still in the same mindset, and they weren't really changing how they went about it. Now, lately, you've seen these $5.5 million fines, $600,000 fine for a business associate, and it turns out that, that it takes uh, HHS about two years to get through one of these sort of audits, you know, if you've had a breach or whatever before they get get to a settlement, uh, we would all like to see that uh, condensed, but it takes them about two years, and so there's been this sort of reluctance to uh, kind of get with the program because it used to be uh, something that, that, uh, that nobody worried about. And, you know, the, the, the other thing about why is there so many myths, for some reason, maybe, maybe um, you know, it, even us lawyers are not comfortable when we when we were exposed to a completely foreign new regulatory regime okay their the regulations are dense you know what I mean they, they go on for pages you have to you, you know they, they don't really say this is requirement one requirement two requirement three you you have to kind of distill the requirements out of um, you know what we say the source code of the regulations of the regulations themselves and so there's been a lack of willingness to attack the, the compliance regulations with that level of rigor. But that's a level of rigor that really applies to any compliance that you're trying to do. I mean, you're always trying to get at the requirements. And it's always the requirements that they can audit you on. And so, I mean, if you're going to be relying on legal help, if they're not focused on individual requirements, understanding every single one, then you're getting bad, uh, you're getting bad advice. So there's been this whole history. A historical thing, I think that's that's kind of uh, played into that, and you know, a lot of grumpy old docs. You know, I've heard them had them tell me I'd rather go to jail than than you know, uh, you know, have them find me. I don't care. You know what I mean? There was this mindset of, you know, hey, we don't care. We're, we, we're doctors. We say we save lives. We don't have time for this privacy and security nonsense. And cover, you know, Big Brother sort of looking over our shoulders, and now. You know, it's really not the compliance. The rules are just a floor, right? You have ransomware. You have, you know, you have uh, cybersecurity hacks from foreign nations. I mean, we live in a 24-7, 365 online universe now. You can't stick your head in the sand any longer. And I think anyone that was hoping that this high-tech act would just be like this thing that would go away is finally, you know, six, seven years later starting to wake up and say, oh, you know, it's not going away. Maybe we should do something about it. Um, I, I was going to make an observation. I mean, it became law in 2013, and here it is 2016. And there's not a lot out there. There, Yes, there was a $5.5 million fine the other day. But there's not a lot out there. So you get this sigh of relief like, oh, okay, it's not really going to do it. They're, they're not going to end. Well, there's more, there's more and more. Actually, more, let me correct a couple things just for the record. It didn't become law in 2013. What you're referring to became law yeah. back, in two, back in 2009. Okay, yeah. and back in back in 2009. Hold on, hold on. Back in 2009, like the breach, the breach notification rule has been law. They, the there was an interim final rule, and 
that's a that's a misstatement interim because it was law. It was good regulation back in 2009, and you've had to comply since then. You know what happened in 2013 was the omnibus rule, and you you sort of made the same mistake that everybody in the industry said is everybody thought the omnibus rule was like the day. The omnibus rule, which is really not a rule in and of itself, the omnibus rule is just this final rulemaking. Okay, fine. They, you know, HHS, and actually, haven't totally finalized the rulemaking, but HHS was mandated when the stat, High Tech Act statute came out to make rules, and and the omnibus rule, in, you know, March 2013 was like their final rulemaking. Okay, we finally made, got all the rules finalized, although a lot of it, I would say, 80 percent of it, was already in play before that. All right, so that's a that's a myth that it all came into play in 2013. But yes, it, it's been in place since 2009. Well, let's say from the industry's part, they really thought it's in place since 2013. Since 2013, now it's 2016. But you're starting to see, uh, you're start. I'm starting to see a lot of anecdotal evidence that things are are, are turning around. That that HHS does intend to be in, uh, aggressive in its enforcement, and you're seeing a lot more hacks. This whole thing about ransomware has got everybody scared. So. Um, I, I think things are, are changing slowly. And HHS is the regulatory enforcement side of things, but we often talk uh, about um, going back to your visible demonstrable evidence, being able to present that either to an auditor from HHS or a court of law. So let's talk about the court of law uh, a, a bit and how that can play in, because you know uh, we we do hear uh, the community hears the stories about the, the millions of dollars of fines, the you know, uh, another laptop walked off with unencrypted PHI, and you know, and, and the wrath of HHS that that may uh, fall out from that. But in in a court case, what you really be fighting, uh, it sounds to me most of the time, would be a negligence action, meaning that uh, you failed to uh, live up to your duty of care. Um, that uh, that the regulations are actually very informative on. So, it, it, would it just be a uh, negligence style case, or are there or are there other types of action that you may have to defend against as well? Yeah, actually, there there there, there, are, there are several actually that I've already been uh, attempted. But so, let's clarify one thing just for any any newbies out there. So, HHS is the Department of Health and Human Services, and within a HHS, it's the Office of Civil Rights. OCR that has um, enforcement, right? Enforcement power over uh, over HIPAA. Okay, when you're talking about protected health information for patients, okay, the FTC has um, enforcement rights for other personal information that have nothing to do with patient data. So, uh, but you can the High Tech Act empowered uh, not only the Department of Justice, I guess, if, if it was the federal government bringing an action, but state. Uh, AGs to bring an action directly under HIPAA, okay? And so those are the only two entities that can bring a civil action under the statute. You, you, there is still no remaining private right of action under HIPAA for an individual plaintiff, right? So the plaintiff's lawyers are clever, and so they look for ways to get around that. And sometimes they use, like, the California Privacy Statute, uh, or other state privacy statutes, and sometimes they use We're it, right? And in some states, courts have held that uh, that the HIPAA rules is the the, the standard, right? And the standard for you know for want of a better word, the yeah. standard of care if it was a malpractice suit, right? The standard that you have to live up to, and the standard that if you yeah. breach that standard, then then you yeah. may be held, um, you know. Um, liable under negligence if you no. if you have so negligence no, right where you were beat into law school duty which causation damages yeah. right so the, the the duty is are you owed a, oh, right you, now, have, no, you have a duty to comply mm -hmm. if it says you no, do and you know what's the standard well but the HIPAA rules I, some I, state I, courts have said the HIPAA rules themselves so those are the, that's the standard and if you breach it you breach the rules then well then you violate it and well, if that causes that that cause damage then, then about, you have a viable cause of action now a lot of plaintiffs I'm have got home, held up on not being able to approve not being able to prove kind of damages that 
courts will accept. You can't, you know, it's not emotional damages. That's not going to work. Damages, to, you know, to get back your reputation or your credit. Some courts have said, well, maybe. So there's been that challenge, but there's no, um, you know, there, 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 it's not but for, it's not for trying, for lack of trying. There's been a lot of suits uh, brought, and there's been some, some suits, uh, that have held uh, an employee, like Walgreens in particular, uh, liable for millions of dollars under respondeat superior, superior, which is, you know, let the master, the master is responsible for, you know, the torts of the wrongs of his or her servants, or in this case, Walgreens employees. We have to do a whole different sort of, you know, uh, yeah. Director's cut on on the case law. And we probably should. But, I don't have to worry so about that's how you wait. That's how you get in the court. Yeah, You're gonna get in the court either uh, either a state uh, AG representing uh, plaintiffs from uh, his or her state, or the, the DOJ bringing some action and on behalf. You have of no idea what that's like, and it's been. And when you're uh, when you're unfortunately faced with having to uh, defend yourself either in court or, or answer an before. auditor. Uh, you know, this, this episode is on no, visible okay. demonstrable you know me and evidence, dog, right? And, and we discussed earlier that, uh, that it's I'm never a dog. complete process. Yeah, yeah. That, that last step of full HIPAA yeah. compliance, uh, is, is likely, you know, the, the mountaintop that, that you're always, you know, trying to get to, but but you're stuck in the, uh, not necessarily stuck, but you're, um, but you're always iterating through that middle step of trying to get there. Like you're reaching for that perfection of full compliance. So, uh, since, since you can't be perfect, but you need to have an ongoing story, uh, more and more visible demonstrable evidence. How do you know when enough is enough? Like, There's only one your, thing to blame. Uh, how do you figure out what your exposure is? Well, uh, yeah, no, yeah, I mean, that, that, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Right? First of all, you have to start with, do you know the requirements? I told her, I said, I right? thought about it. Obviously, too. you don't know the requirements. You're just wandering around the desert lost. I'm right? trying to set this webinar up. You can't be expected to laugh. comply with something you don't know. Yeah, you know I, Yogi, Yogi Berra said, you don't know where you're going. So on, so forth, you know, how do you know when you get there? Right, I mean, so uh, you, it, that's where it starts, okay? And then, and, and then you, you, you would like with something like our I scorecard, you it, show uh, that you've gotten better at uh, your compliance story because you're covering more of the requirements well, as you so go on over time, okay? And there are there are some flexibility uh, uh, principles so built into so the forth, specifically yeah. mentioned the security rule is you yeah, have to do what's I, reasonable and appropriate yeah, for an organization of your size, complexity. Exactly number of uh, resources, et cetera, sophistication, techno uh, technological sophistication, et cetera. So it's almost like the, the reasonable person standard in negligence, right? That it's what's reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size. And that's that's what you would be arguing, and your counsel would be arguing in front of an auditor, and that's what your counsel would be arguing in front of a court of law, uh, a jury or a judge, is, look, my client has done what was reasonable and appropriate or in an organization of this size, complexity, et cetera. Of course, the more of the requirements that you're in compliance with, the more visible demonstrable evidence that you show, the better, the easier it is uh, going to be for your counsel to make that argument. Right. So it sounds like uh, wherever you are in the process, you need to do more. I think that's the thing. That's one of the, that's one of the lessons here, that this is not a, a set and forget thing. This is why we talk about changing an organization's DNA. This is why we talk about the compliance being a problem, right? Because it, it's got organizational complexity. You're never going to be done. Bad guys don't rest. You know, Neil Young says the rest never sleeps, right? I, I don't know what that means, but to me it's kind of like the bad guys don't rest. They're getting smarter all the time as to how to hack and how to get no, how to get on, I mean, how to get this I, I pitch been, I did because it's worth a lot of money on the black market. And so this is a, a, this is a, a continuous thing like risk assessments, right? We're, we're going to do a whole thing on risk assessments. We're getting ready to release espresso. But That's not the topic of this talk, happen, but, so you know, once a year is a minimum. You should probably be doing risk assessments once a quarter, once a month. Uh, it's actually real-time databases. What we're trying to do some risk assessments on, on real-time. You know, because the threat land, uh, landscape is changing that fast. Really the door open. 
Right. Okay. Um, uh, Martin, do you have any questions? Responsibility for that. No, the the reasonable, appropriate uh, for an organization your size just always bothers me because who's going to figure that out? The auditor so, you're sitting no, with there. Oh, I think you should do this, so I think you shouldn't okay. do that. You know, how do you how do you really come down and determine? Okay, I've done the best job I can. Well. You know, yes, you may say who's going to figure that out, but as it turns out, um, negligence suits happen all day, every day, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of times uh, a day in, in all the states. And, and a judge and a jury have to figure out what that reasonable person is. And it's the same thing here, what's reasonable and appropriate for the courts. Any auditors, they they have to figure that out. Did you did you do a good job, a good enough job? And you know, it'll probably uh, affect the size of uh, the penalty. It's not really a fine. It's not a criminal thing. So they're, they're called civil monetary penalties, CMPs. But you know, you may get slapped on the wrist. Uh, God forbid you have a breach, you probably won't get slapped on the wrist. On the wrist, just the breach notification costs themselves will be in the millions. But if you have a breach on top of but, you stuck your head in the sand and you got wolf on the black fine uh, and there's really no cap. There's a cap, there's a cap on, on civil monetary if, penalties if there's, there's, fines some short, reason, but there's a cap on 1.5 million per that, type of violation. The there are dozens of types of violations. There's really no cap and we just saw that recent that uh, CMP against um, actually against whom it escapes me, but just, you know, $5.5 million. So that goes to show you that the $1.5 million cap is not uh, is not really a cap. But Martin, to answer your question, yes, the auditors and judges answer that question all day, every day. What 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 is, uh, what's reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size, uh, et cetera. It's, I mean, we call them weasel words, and they sort of are, but you know, that's, that's, that's American jurisprudence. That's yeah. the standard that we come up with. That's the sort of the best that we can do. So back, um, back, to, back to John's point, if you get from point A to point D and you just don't stop at point D, you go to E, F, G, and, and H as you can. Well, you, you, you have to comply with all, all the 169 yes. requirements. So until you've done that, and then the question becomes, well, how satisfactory are you complying with those requirements? You know what I mean? And then time changes and the threat landscape changes. So did you include new threats in your in your risk assessment, even though you've done past the risk assessment, so it's not like you haven't done risk, risk assessments, but the threat landscape changed. So did you change? You see what I'm saying? So it, it yes, you'll get better and better, but full compliance is this sort of aspirational thing, right? You'll get you'll get to a point where your story is pretty darn good. Okay, you got most of the things in place, and you're, you know, I mean, then you're in sort of monitor mode. Okay, but but that's going to take you a while, and, and and by a while, I don't mean six months. It's probably going to take most organizations years, five or six years to get to that point. Right, and that's that's when you can say you can feel with some confidence if you're the CEO that you got a good compliance story to tell if there was a breach or an audit or whatever. Anything short of that. Uh, you know, and it's, it's it's just wishful thinking. So, uh, guys, if there's no more questions, I think we should probably call this a wrap as far as telling your compliance story. Uh, we're going to do a number of these, and we're hoping for you guys to give us some questions. Uh, but we'll probably be doing this, doing this director's cut series maybe on 10, 15, 20 different questions. I'm paying attention to you, but i got to watch where this is. Yeah. Uh, i got a minute. With uh, my closing thought, I would uh, just say that everyone's uh, compliance story will be different. That's why we, we were talking about uh, the weasel words, the fact that reasonable and appropriate is vague, uh, the, what's your standard of care. The, the reason that's, that's vague is be, because it, it accounts for the fact that there are too many variables to account for. It's too, spe it's too fact specific. So, uh, um, you know, if you're a fan of chaos theory, this is a great example. Uh, so, so that's why it needs to be general because trying to drill it down more specifically is going to wind up having inconsistent results. Uh, that's why your, the size of your organization and all those other variables are mentioned, but that's not an exhaustive list, it's sort of a guideline because you know, the, the facts for Kaiser Permanente aren't going to be the same facts for your two-doc operation or what have you. Exactly. Okay, I think that's a wrap. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Right. Thank uh, you.